So I might need your help here, guys. Recently, my viewers hacked my server. I hosted a hack the server challenge, which was a three day open challenge where I asked my YouTube audience to try to hack a server that I deployed in the cloud. And very quickly, that thing got breached. <laughs> but in all seriousness, whether or not you participated in it, I think this will be a very valuable video here where I'm gonna share the solution to this challenge in hopes that it can help further your learning as you continue on the journey and try and get into this field. And I also wanted to say that if you did participate in the challenge and you weren't able to hack the server, then you should definitely watch this video all the way until the end so you can see how you can further your learning in this field and really optimize things going forward. I think it'll be very valuable for you. So let's get right into the video. All right, so let's step through the solution to the challenge. The first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to find the IP address, which is different than at the time of the challenge. I kind of stood this server up a second time, but um, this is the new IP for now. And we're able to access it. I just want to check that. Of course, the very first thing we're going to start out with is an Nmap scan of this IP to see what's open. So we see three ports, FTP, SSH, and HTTP. Now, to save time here, let me just say that the HTTP, the website there, was a rabbit hole. Uh, that WordPress site um, was basically set up to be a decoy. That wasn't the actual solution. As far as I know, there was no known vulnerability that would allow you to exploit and, and get into the server. Now, from a general methodology standpoint, everyone has their own methodology. For me personally, when I if I were to see these three ports, the very first one that I would look into would be FTP. And the reason for that is it's very quick to do some tests on that versus a website HTTP, that could be like a really massive time sink. There could be a lot going on with the website and things like that. So I like to take it from the approach of, let me look for the low hanging fruit first and then go from there, go into more complex things as I go. So I like to start with FTP. So let's do that. We're gonna check for something called anonymous FTP by providing the username anonymous and the password can be just any random thing. And we see login successful. So we are able to log in with anonymous FTP. We can take a look around here with the DIR command. And it looks like there are a bunch of users on the system. This could be like a home folder or something like that. Uh, so we would want to look through these. We can maybe use some automated tool to kind of help us enumerate through this large number of folders here. But to save time, I'm just going to go into the Ubuntu folder and take a look there. And we see that there is a note.txt file. So we can download that to our system by using the get command, get note.txt. And if we take a look at that, we can see that there's actually a note talking about a password reset request and it provides a temporary password and it says, hey, don't forget to change this after you log in. Well, you know, we definitely want to do our due diligence and test to see maybe the user didn't change the password yet, didn't update the password. Maybe this is still valid somewhere. So just thinking back to our ports that we saw open earlier, we could go and look and test this against that WordPress site to see if maybe that works for like the admin user, or maybe there's an Ubuntu user that's the admin. But again, going back to methodology where I would first try this is SSH because SSH is very quick to test. You can just enter in the SSH command, provide the password and see, is that successful to helping you log in or not? And uh, again, it goes back to the low hanging fruit. What can you find those quick wins and then go into the more complex things from there. So if we try Ubuntu at this server's IP, and then we provide the password that we got right here, we see it is successful. We're able to log into the system. And actually, you know, we are in our home folder here and we see that was where the note.txt was. And if we go back one, now we see all the stuff that we were seeing in the FTP server. So we could do a number of things from here to try to find the privilege escalation because we are just a basic user here. We are not like the admin, the root user, right? So we want to do something called privilege escalation where we escalate from a basic Ubuntu user here to the actual root account, which is essentially like the admin account or the system account if you're more familiar with Windows. So we want to look for some kind of vulnerability to do that. Typically, I would start off... Actually, I just noticed this, right? We are part of the LXD group. So... I don't know if anyone did this, but there theoretically, there should be another privilege escalation vector this is vulnerable to that you can leverage that LXD group permission to actually escalate privileges to root. So I'd love to hear from you guys. Did anyone, did anyone try that on this challenge? Uh, I just noticed this now, but yeah, this is a container group that uh, you could deploy like a container and then break out of that container and run it as root. Uh, you can get root access that way. I would definitely recommend as an aside to look into the LXD privilege escalation technique if you're not familiar with that. 
Pretty cool one for sure. But the intended route, at least, was to look at the opt directory. Um, and general methodology, I would typically do a sudo minus L as well to see if we have any kind of special sudo permissions into anything. Just to save time, I'll show you that, or I'll say that we don't. Uh, at least in the challenge, we did not. So if we look in the opt directory, we'll notice this company portal service executable here. It's red, which indicates that it's a set UID binary. And we can see that when we look in detail at the permissions. Now, if you guys remember from the email of the instructions, what you're trying to do is read this flag.txt file here. Now it is owned by the root account. We are not the root account. Only the root account can read uh, and also write. But just to show you, we can't read this flag file as is. We're going to need to get access as the root account to do that. Now, because this is a set UID binary, what that means is that anytime this thing is run, which anyone can run it by the way, but anytime it's run, it runs as the file owner. And the file owner in this case is the root account. So if we could find any vulnerability in this binary, and we can see like, what is this file, right? We could run file on that. It is a 32 bit executable an elf binary. Uh, it's stripped as well. That's something to note. So we're not going to be able to have access to reading the function names and stuff like that. So it could make the reverse engineering a little bit trickier, just something to keep in mind. Uh, but if we can find a vulnerability in this binary, we can actually leverage that potentially to get code execution as the root account. And if we have that, we can read the flag. So let's go ahead and, uh, and try that for ourselves here. And I believe at the time of the challenge, the stack.yaml file is not readable by everyone. Um, but yeah, that was just something I used to set up by a, a not, like the, uh, the WordPress server. So nothing too useful in the case of this challenge. So to take a look into this, easiest way, let's just copy this and, and put it in our home directory, right? So we do that. And now if I come over here and I, I look at the FTP again, so we do FTP into this server here. Log in with anonymous FTP. CD into Ubuntu, DIR. Now we get the company portal service. Dot, uh, yeah, company portal service. So we'll do a get on that to download it to our local machine. So now we have it on our local machine. So we can do some you know, further deep dives into it from a reverse engineering standpoint. Now, I'm going to start by running it in what is called a uh, a debugger. Actually, before I do that, there's a preliminary step that I'm going to do. I'm actually, essentially what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to look at, and I already have it on my system here, so I can I can delete this one. I was just kind of showing you guys how to go about doing it. But what I could do is I could run it with something called Pwn Debug, uh, which is a extension for GDB. And there's a number of things we can look at. Let's try to look at the functions. So if I do info functions, now, unfortunately, because this is a strip binary, we can't see most of the functions here. So we're going to have to go a step deeper and look at this in like a, a disassembler. Another thing we can do is run check sec on the binary to see like what kind of security protections are in place. In this case, we got a complete green light here because we have no stack canary, no data execution prevention or NX, uh, no PI, which is position independent executable. Essentially, there's no mitigations that could stand in our way. So we should theoretically, if we find the vulnerability for it, uh, we could do a buffer overflow, a basic buffer overflow against this. So, okay, yeah, that is really good information to have. Let's load this up in a disassembler. You can use something like Ghidra if you want a free open source option. There's also IDA free. I'm going to use Binja, Binary Ninja for this one, which is a paid product, but um, whatever you use, this is going to be a very similar process. So I just hit file and I open it up in this and then we'll be presented with the screen here. So if we take a look at the main, which is the, like the entry point, we can see what's going on here. So nothing's really happening inside the main function, it would appear, but it is calling this other function here. Uh, and this function is what contains like the welcome message and stuff like that, which by the way, we should run this. That is a, uh, a step that I skipped, uh, that you don't want to skip, is that we should just run this as a normal user to see how it functions, right? So it says, welcome to the company portal, enter username. If I enter like test or something, it says access granted, which is kind of interesting. What if I enter something completely random? 
And uh, we see that every time we run it, pretty much, no matter what we type, we get this access granted. So that's kind of interesting. Very important to approach it from a basic user perspective first. So we do that. And it makes sense now looking at the, you know, reverse engineering this because basically what it's doing is it's just presenting this like welcome banner here. And it's always just saying access granted, no matter what we enter. But here is the interesting part and where the vulnerability comes into play. It's using the gets function here. So even if we look at the disassembly, it's making a call to gets on this line here. And if you're not familiar with gets, if you take a look at, you know, your man pages here, you can say man gets, and uh, let me see here, man gets, and we can see that it straight up says in the description, never use this function. That is because this is inherently vulnerable to buffer overflow. It does not perform any bounds checks, and also looking further around this function, there were no bounds checks manually implemented by the developer of this binary, right? So, yeah. This should definitely be vulnerable based on what we're seeing here to a buffer overflow vulnerability. So let's take that a step further. Let's get that working on our attacker controlled machine and see if we can come up with an exploit. Now, in doing this, the very first step that I would go for here is I would try to run this under a debugger like Pwn Debug. So let's do that. Actually, I'm going to do it here. So let's say GDB dash pwn debug and company portal service. And I'm going to use cyclic to generate a pattern of 200 characters to try to identify you know, try to crash the program and identify a crash, right? So if I do that, I hit R for run to run the program, and then I feed in all this data here. And we see in the registers, it does crash. It's invalid address. And this is what's important is what we see here uh, under EIP. We see TAAA. I'm going to take that, do cyclic minus L. Slam that in there, and we see found offset at 76. So after 76 bytes, we actually overflow and crash the program. We're able to then... Uh, control the execution flow of this program. Because if you didn't know, EIP is basically the register that 32-bit Intel uses to know what address to you know, perform a calculation from next. It tells it where to go. It tells the program where it should be going. So if we can control what gets written into that, we can control where the program grow goes and we can point it to our malicious code, basically hijack the execution of the program. So in order to do that, I'm going to use something called Pwn Tools, which is a module for Python that can really help us easily write an exploit for this. Now, another thing that I want to do is I want to use Ropper. If I use something like Ropper, I can actually identify maybe like a jump ESP that's going to help us even easier control the execution flow to this program. So let me pull that up right now. So we can say like Ropper and then file. So Ropper file, in this case, the file is called company portal service. And then whatever gadget we wanna, we wanna look for, let's look for like a jump ESP, jump to the stack pointer. And uh, yeah, let's install Ropper on this real quick. And, uh, I don't know how that typo came in there. Let's fix that. And okay, yeah, we have a jump ESP at this address, so we can use that in our exploit. Now, to speed things along, I could show you the exploit that I wrote here for this. And we can kind of step through it together. So we have here this exploit. And here's some templating code that I got actually from another YouTuber by the name of CryptoCat. So credit goes to him for creating this template. Uh, definitely a really good one. I find myself using this one quite a bit. Uh, that allows you, it gives you a lot of options on different modes to run this in and stuff like that. I will um, provide a link to this exploit template in the description below as well, just to, to spread, the, uh, spread the love there on this. Uh, let, let's update this. We're going to need this to be company portal service in this case. Oops. 
Uh, re- it's in read only mode. No worries. We'll, we'll fix that later. But yeah, this is where all the magic is happening down here where we have um, the exploit code. So we're going to do an IO start and you can also reference the Pwn Tools documentation to really um, di- uh, dive deeply into like the different options you have and stuff like that. But we're going to specify the offset, which we found to be 76 to EIP. And then I am going to let it automatically find the jump ESP, uh, which Pwn Tools can do built in. It can do a lot of stuff built in, which is really powerful with it. But yeah, we're going to have it find that for us and, uh, and use that. And then we're going to have some shell code here. Originally, I had some shell code to just read flag.txt, but we're going to go further than that. We're going to get a full-on reverse shell as root. So we can use something built into Pwn Tools called Shellcraft to generate some shell code for us so we don't even have to manually write shell code. And we'll have it generate shell code for uh, getting a SH shell. And so we do that. And then we build out our payload. So we can start with padding it with uh, 76 no ops, so no operation, 0x90. And then plug in the jump ESP address that it finds. We jump to our shell code. We can pad that out with uh, 16 no ops before the shell code, just so it doesn't step on itself and everything runs smoothly. And we're essentially just going to have it write that to a payload file. And then it's going to look for the colon because that's the prompt that the uh, program is giving us when we, when we ran it. So like when I ran it here, it said, enter your username. And then there was a colon here. So after the colon is where we put in our user input. So that's why we specify it here. Say send line after colon and then put in the contents of the payload and then IO interactive to get that sweet reverse shell. So let's go ahead and, uh, oops, and, and try that for ourselves here. So speed things along, I'm going to just copy all of this here. And we're going to just slap that into a file here in the op directory. We are going to create one called exploit.py. And on the target server, it does have Pwn tools installed for you guys to use. So that's pretty nice. What we're going to do here is just update this, like I was saying, to company portal service so that it matches the actual name of the binary. And then, yeah, from there, we could just say python exploit.py. And boom, you see we have a shell run the who am I? We have a root shell. So we fully rooted the server, which means we are now able to read the flag.txt file. So yeah, awesome. This is how we were able to solve this challenge. Uh, let me know if you guys have any questions on that uh, down in the comments section below and hopefully it was of help to you guys. I just wanted to mention if you are learning this stuff with the intention of getting into this field, you definitely want to send me a DM to my Instagram at Elevate Cyber. What we'll do is we'll come up with a strategy to help get you into the field beyond what we're just covering in this video because I only have so long uh, to explain stuff in this video. We'll go into much more detail in that call.